Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. So this is uh, going to be the second episode of uh, the abandoned sunan. And, uh, and today, today inshallah, we're going to be dealing with the, the raising of the hands in the salat. How it should be done, when it should be done. And the fact that nowadays you see a lot of the people no longer doing this. They only raise their hands for the takbirat al-ihram. And then that's it. And then they feel like they don't have to raise their hands anymore. And of course, a lot of this goes back to the different madhahib and the people that follow these madhahib. But like I, like I mentioned in the last, uh, the last, uh, uh, the last episode, there's nothing wrong with a person. And well, let me clarify this first in this episode and go back to what I mentioned in the last episode. There's nothing wrong with a person who who who's learning a madhahib. So I'm not I'm not telling the people, for example. Uh, don't learn the madhab and don't 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 go back to the to the speech of the ulama. No, we, we go back to the kalam. We go back and look what Al Imam Ahmed said. We go back and look what uh, Al Imam Malik said, and we go back and look what Al Imam Shafi'i said. You know, and, and we go back and look what uh, you know the the, the aqwal of Abi Hanifa. You know, we, but but we only accept the statements of these ulama when they are in accordance with what we know from the authentic Sunnah. So maybe the, uh, maybe one of these ulama they 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 brought a hadith that's not authentic. It wasn't deemed as authentic, you know. Because if you look at it out of these four imams, who was the imam of hadith? Who was the? It was a, uh, Imam Ahmed. Was the you know of course uh, Imam Ahmed and Imam Malik were the two strongest as far as the knowledge of hadith. But the compilation of the ma the madhab of Imam Malik was based on the fiqh of Medina. All right, so he, because Imam Malik, he was in one place, and Imam Ahmed, he traveled a lot. So uh, Imam Ahmed, he was exposed to a lot more different ahadith that were authentic and that were not authentic. And he was the one that the people in that time, they relied on to know if the hadith was authentic or not. So this is like, so we first, whenever we're bu building our opinions of fiqh on any, any hadith, we have to look at the authenticity of that hadith. Is it authentic or is it not? If it's not authentic, then we're, we're not going to deal with it. You know, and if there's no shawahid for that hadith and, and other hadith that are authentic, then we leave it. You know, we're not going to do something that's not authentic. Everything that we do, we try to find out and we try to first and foremost make sure that it is authentic. And it goes back to the Messenger of Allah. And, but the thing is, is now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but now the problem is a lot of people, they don't even go back and check. They just they blind follow the Imam. So, I, like I said, I don't, I don't have an issue with a person following the method of Imam Ahmed or following the method of, of Imam Malik and so on and so forth. I don't have an issue with that. But what I do have an issue with is the people blind following those Imams. And then when you present the Ahadith, they won't accept it because it goes against the statement of their Imam. This type of Ta'asub, this is not permissible. And this is the same thing, this is the very thing that those Imams warn the people against. So we go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. We go back to the understanding of the Sahaba. We go back to the understanding of those three generations, um, uh, you know, those, those, the, the best three generations. And that's where we get our understanding of the religion from, because that's where they got their understanding of the religion from. Where do you think that Imam Malik got his understanding from? So the point is, is we go back to the sources that they went to, and we learn it, and we look, and we see their aqwal and how they understood it. And we see, like, uh, what they said, like, for example, like Imam Ahmed, we, we go back and we check and see, okay, did he accept the hadith? Did he reject the hadith? What was his opinion of the hadith? How did he understand the hadith? The hadith? And we check this. But the thing is, is we're not going to take anything that clearly goes, that is contrary to the sunnah. And none of these imams narrated speech or anything that they did, they never did this on purpose, like, to be, to contradict the sunnah. But it's just, it happens. We, you know, one person might have knowledge of a hadith, the other person doesn't have knowledge of. So this person has a statement because he has a hadith that this one doesn't have. So, but then if you blind follow that imam, then you say, oh, no, no, my imam said this. And he says, well, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this. Now you reject it. This is, what we, this is what we're telling the people not to do. So it's not about following the madhab, but it's about the blind following of a madhab. To the point where like you take every single statement. So this, this, is, this is what we need to like, let the people know. You know. We're not just telling the people, hey, don't follow a madhab. But if you are going to follow a madhab, you know, follow it within the guidelines of the of the Quran and the Sunnah of this of this religion. You know, we're not we're not blind followers. We go back and we follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't follow any other human being over the Prophet ever. So we don't take the aqwal of the Imam and reject the hadith of the Messenger. A'udhu Billah. So, anyways, uh, this this one, like I said, is going to be dealing with the raising of the hands. So this now is in also in Kitab Al Adhan and Sahih Al Bukhari. Uh, this is in Bab Rafa al Yadain, Ida Kabbara, wa Ida Raka, wa Ida Rafa. So, this is the chapter on raising the hands, Ida Kabbara, 
All right, of course, this is dealing first off with the uh, takbir al ihram. Wayda raka'ah, when he goes into rukur. Wayda rafa'ah, you know, when he comes up. And when he comes up, and this also deals with coming out of the second, uh, the, the, the middle, the first tashahud. Okay? Then when you come out, that you also raise the hands. Either rafa'ah. Hadith, all right, so this hadith is a 736 hadith. I didn't give you guys the hadith number for the last for the last one. Uh, let me see if I can find it. The last hadith was 725 from the last episode. 725. 725. This one now is 736 in Sahih al-Bukhari. Like I said, this is the print that I have. So this is the Mu'assasa al risala uh, At the time when this was printed about uh, 10 years ago in Yemen, uh, well it wasn't printed in Yemen, but I bought it in Yemen. Like uh, this was the best, the most, the most authentic uh, and the best print of a, a Sahih Bukhari. So he said, Bab رفع اليدين إذا كبر وإذا رفع وإذا رفع حدثنا محمد بن مقاتل قال أخبرنا عبد الله قال أخبرنا يونس عن الزهري أخبرني سالم بن عبد الله عن عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قام في الصلاة رفع يديه حتى حتى تكون هذو منكبيه وكان يفعل ذلك حين يكبر للركوع ويفعل ذلك إذا رفع رأسه من الركوع ويقول سمي الله لمن حمده ولا يفعل ذلك إلا ولا يفعل ذلك في السجود. So here we got this hadith is reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما. He said, uh, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إذا قام if he stood up to pray, رفع يديه حتى تكون حذوة منكبه So he would raise his hands up until they were like lined up with like with his with his shoulders. You know, he would raise his hands up. So not like like this, but there are different narrations. Okay, there are different narrations, but we're going to deal with this narration right now. So he would do it to the point where it was lined up with his, with his shoulders. حذوة منكبه وَكَانَ يَفْعَلُ ذَلَكَ حِينَ يُكَبِّرْ لِلْرُكُوعِ And he would do this, Allahu Akbar, when he would go into Rukur. Alright. وَيَفْعَلُ ذَلَكَ إِذَا رَفَعَ رَاسُهُ مِنَ الْرُكُوعِ And then when he comes out of Rukur, when he says, سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لِي مَنْ حَمِدَ رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدَ حَمْدًا كَثِيرًا طَيِّبًا مُبَارَكًا فِي He would do that again. He would raise his hands. And then he said, وَيَفْعَلُ ذَلَكَ إِذَا رَفَعَ رَاسُهُ مِنَ الْرُكُوعِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears the one who praises him. And he would never do this in sujood. So you never see the Prophet sallallahu like some of the people, I remember this back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, a lot of the people, they would be in the tashahud, uh, the, you know, the first tashahud, and they would, Allahu Akbar, they would, they would raise their hands and then they would come out of the, the jalsa. Uh, as you see that the Prophet sallallahu never did this in sujood, and what he means is coming, either coming out of sujood, what he would do is when he came out of that tashahud, when he stood up, Allahu Akbar, he would raise his hands. And of course, this comes in a different narration. But this narration is dealing with the, the takbirat al-ihram, going into rukur, and coming out of rukur. And, and how many people now do you see do not do this anymore? Like, how, how many people, like, if you look in the masjid and you see throughout the salat, how many hands are going up? Or just watch people while they're praying, just their sunan, and see how many people are actually... Uh, applying the sunnah and how many people have just completely abandoned it if they ever did it in the first place. So Allah must die. Again, these are the types of sunnah that we need to bring back because these are, you know, this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu always did. It was reported by the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu said, Sallu kamara aytamuni usalli. Pray in the manner that you see me pray. Not pray in the, pray in the manner that you see Imam Malik pray or pray in the manner that you see uh, Imam Abi Hanifa pray. Uh, Abu Hanifa pray. But pray in the manner that you see the Prophet pray, and we see that through the Sunnah, and that's why you see the Kitab al-Salat. Look how big it is, and how much it was reported about the Salat because of the ihtimam, the care that the Sahaba had with reporting the way in the manner that the Prophet sallallahu prayed. So because it's also the most important ibadah that we have after the shahadat. So we have to have major ihtimam with this. We don't want to go up and have to answer for abandoning Sunnah on the Day of Judgment. This is not something that we want to answer for. Wa Allahu Mustaan wa Ilahuna Subhanakallahu wa Bihamdika Shalom Ala.